Jim Collins has a book called From Good to Great, and he speaks of a question that preyed on his mind for many years. How is it that certain companies make the leap from being good to great? Are there certain universal characteristics that if you apply, you can make the same leap into greatness? So he brought together a team of experts and they identified a set of elite performing companies that were sustaining good results for 15 years plus. And then they compared them against another set of companies that only ever stayed at good. They never became great. And after five years of dedicated research to answer this one question and sifting through mountains of data and going through thousands of pages of interviews, they came to the conclusion that there are certain determinants of success. And he writes that at the core of it all is the following, to foster a culture of discipline. What is discipline? I speak of the discipline that was defined by Abraham Lincoln many years ago, who said discipline is your ability to choose between what you want now and what you want most. Or in other words, you can say, it's your ability to say no when deep down you really want to say yes. Exemplified so clearly in the life of Ibrahim sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He is one of the greatest of all creation. A man in whose footsteps humanity follows every year during the season of Hajj. The exemplar worshiper, the Khalil, the intimate friend of Allah. The Ummah, the one-man nation, Ibrahim alayhi salam, after all, was instructed by Allah to migrate on numerous occasions and with discipline, he migrated. He was instructed by Allah to engage in manual labor, to build a building in a scorching heat desert. He did that in discipline. He was instructed by Allah to slaughter his own son. Who can do that? Yet in discipline, he upheld the instruction. He was instructed by Allah to leave his suckling son Ismail and the mother of Ismail in an uninhabited, lifeless desert. And with discipline, he upheld the instruction. Allah instructed him to circumcise himself at the old age of 80. And with discipline, he did just that. And that is why Allah praised him. And he said, Wa Ibrahim, wafa. Ibrahim, Allah said, the man who fulfilled his promise. Allah said, When I, Allah, tested Ibrahim with commandments and he fulfilled them with perfection. Then we turn to Hajj. What is Hajj? But a yearly celebration of the disciplined family of Ibrahim. And every one of the rites of Hajj is a vivid training ground to produce Muslims like you who are disciplined. No sexual intimacy, no foul language, no argumentation during Hajj, Allah said. Discipline, despite the clash of cultures, different languages, hot temperaments, scorching heat, chaos at Mina, chaos Muzdalifah. What do you see there other than unity and togetherness and people moving in a set motion, one voice, one uniform, one ibadah, one Lord who was glorified in a national spectacle of discipline that is second to none. And the intention of the Sharia ah is for this ethic of discipline to overflow from the boundaries of the Haram and into the life of every Muslim. In conclusion, there can be no success, no happiness, no accomplishment, no flourishing in dunya and the hereafter for those who live undisciplined lives, Muslims or non-Muslims, and I share with you examples from the non-Muslims before we turn to our own tradition. The first is a Japanese case study. Who would have thought now when you come into the city of Hiroshima on one of the modern contemporary bullet trains that this was a city that was devastated by tragedy? Who would have thought that just two minutes after the American B-29 nuclear bomber dropped its bomb on the city of Hiroshima, that the city simply ceased to exist, everything incinerated, flattened to the ground, 120 seconds or so. But despite this tragedy, despite the loss of hundreds of thousands of lives, despite Japan possessing hardly any natural resources with the exception perhaps to fish, despite them having problems with volcanoes, 100 active volcanoes in and around Japan more than any other country, despite them suffering 1500 earthquakes every single year more than any other country, the resurrection of Hiroshima began 
just a few hours after the bomb was set on them. The very next day, the lights came back on in some of the regions of Hiroshima. Discipline. People who wanted to build their nation. Then about 30% of power was restored to the surviving homes. Then four days later, the water pumps were restored. There were 30 people who were incinerated, vaporized by the nuclear bomb in the Bank of Japan. Just a few days later, that very same bank reopened with no roof, working under the open sky and using umbrellas when it started to rain. Discipline, such that the word holiday and Japan they hardly ever feature in the same sentence. The trains that leave at 12 a.m. taking people home at midnight from work are just as busy with the trains leaving at 5. They've in fact used a term in the 1970s in Japan called karochi, which literally means death because of work. And I don't endorse this, but it is discipline. They overwork themselves to a level that some of them die in the workplace. Companies are now offering financial incentives to the Japanese workers to leave at 5 p.m., go home. But even the money is not working, they stay till 9 and 10. Ethic of discipline. In fact, the author of the book Made in Japan, he said that after World War II, the average Japanese citizen was working 16 hours a day in return for a cup of rice. And they did that without complaining in order to rebuild their nation. We are worthy of this ethic of discipline. And the second case study is a German case study. Germany who suffered losses of two world wars hardly within the span of 20 years. And just after World War II, six million Germans were killed. Five millions held in captivity. Two million German women raped by the Soviets and others. 500,000 children born because of this rape who don't know their biological fathers. The Allied bombing had flattened almost every city in Germany and the male population declined severely. They were dead or in captivity. So what happened? They didn't give up. Discipline. The women came down to the streets and they had two objectives. The first, to clear the rubble, the debris, and with their own hands, with no machinery, they cleared 400 million cubics of rubble. 400 million meters squared of rubble with their own hands. And the second thing they wanted to do was to find the school books to reopen the education system and to continue teaching their children. Just 10 years after this devastation, every industry in Germany was operational. Medical industry, building industry, transport, communication. It was all working. Just 10 years. Then just 20 years after it, German products now have the greatest reputation in the world. You say Audi, you say Mashallah. Germany now, 20 years later, has the biggest national industry in the whole of Europe and is the biggest capital exporter in the world. Then just 30 years later, after the war, Germany is now one of the seven leading and advanced economies of the world. They call it the G7. How does any of these secular examples relate to us? These were examples of discipline. These were examples of people who preferred what they wanted most over what they may have wanted now. And I want to say that we as Muslims, we as ambassadors of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, ambassadors of the final and only true religion that Allah accepts for humanity. Us as Muslims, we are worthier of this ethic of discipline than anyone else. As believers in a life that shall come after this fleeting one, no one has a greater duty to live by discipline in the masjid or in the workplace or at home or with their friends or on the weekends. No one has a greater duty to live by the ethic of discipline than us. No one should be in better control of their emotions, their speech, their behavior, their desires, their reactions than us. No one should be able to delay pleasure, delay gratification than us. No one should be more focused on the task ahead of them, which is entering Jannah than us. After all, didn't our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tell us of the reward of those who are disciplined? And he said, Anything you leave purely for the sake of Allah, Allah will send you a replacement that is better than it. That is the outcome of discipline, choosing between what you want most and what you want now. Yusuf Alayhi Salam, was he not seduced by a beautiful high-ranking woman? And he said, no, haram ma'ad Allah, I fear Allah. So what did Allah give? give him to thank him for this discipline. He established him on the land. He gave him authority, space on the earth that he was deprived of in jail. Then in a bizarre turn of events, the very same woman who seduced him 
came back to Yusuf, as the scholars of Tafsir said, asking for the hand of Yusuf in marriage. And on their wedding night, Yusuf says to the woman, Hada khayrun mimma kunti turideen. Is this not better than what you wanted from me all those years ago? This is the promise of Allah. The hands of the disciplined will never go without fail. Sulaiman, when he saw how his horses, his marvelous parade distracted him from Salatul Asr till the sun had set and he'd missed the prayer, he behaved with discipline and he sacrificed the horses in repentance and Allah was grateful. So instead of horseback, he gave him the back of the wind. You mount that instead and you go to wherever you wish using the wind. The hands of the disciplined never go without fill. Had the Muslim businessman behaved with discipline and stayed away from the haram and doubtful sources of money, Allah would have given him the halal equivalent. It would have made its way to him anyway. Had our sister who maybe compromised her hijab, behaved with discipline and held on to it stubbornly and defiantly, Allah would have sent to her all of the wholesome things in life that she wants, a happy marriage and healthy children and mental well-being and others, but just behave with discipline and believe Allah. Had our brother who had not lowered his gaze, who did not avoid a lustful appetite, had he behaved with discipline, and forced his gaze to the ground and protected his private parts and ended the conversations, deleted the photos and made an effort to fix his ways. Allah would have helped him till not a trace of sin remains in his life. This is the outcome of discipline. So dear brothers and sisters, discipline is not about punishment. It's not about restricting your time for pleasure and occasional play. No, discipline is about choosing between what you want now and what you want most. It's about saying no Although deep down you may really want to say yes. Discipline is essentially a bridge that connects between where you are now and where you want to be tomorrow in Jannah. And this was the bridge that was crossed by Prophet Ibrahim so many times during his life. And perhaps this is the secret why the topic of discipline is repeated every year during the discussion of Hajj. Because this is the same bridge Allah wants us to remind us of. And this is the same bridge that Allah intends that we cross every day of our life till we arrive at Jannah.